Thank you very much. A continuación va a intervenir Estefanos Polizoides, quien junto con, con Liz Mull eh, se dedican a, como doctores de ciudades a, a sanarlas. Eh, y es del tema del que va a hablar a continuación. Thank you all, and thank you for the great privilege of having invited me to speak today. I would like to start with um, a, a small reading of uh, the beginning of, of what I wrote uh, for this booklet that you've all gotten today. A small paragraph <clears throat> that says the following. The century-long senseless imposition of urbanist modernism on virtually every country in the world has been a calamity of unprecedented proportions. We've lost design intelligence and construction skills, economic assets and cultural monuments, unique rituals and common ways of life. We've sacrificed the pride of difference to a deadening sense of uniformity, of place, and of culture. And I, I decided to start that way because uh, it, it seems to me that the evidence is mounting that we're at the end of this era. We've reached the point where there couldn't possibly be any more because most places in the world have actually been destroyed. And, um, here we go. Am I, this is not working? So, do I have to work on this? Keyboard, yeah? Okay, no problem. So, I, just a, a very short review of how we got to this point. Uh, three ingredients of the architecture of anywhere, uh, the complete rejection of local modes of understanding, the, the conceptual framework of different people in different places, and the replacement by some kind of normative, generalized uh, sense of, of uh, uh, schemes or thoughts about how the entire world ought to be, ought to be organized, um, a shift in scale, a catastrophic shift in scale, and then an emphasis on the single object and, and residual space between objects as being part of the, of the dominant uh, culture of city making uh, in our time. Uh, and one has to ask the question, uh, where are we? Which continent is this? What city is this? What climate is this? And what culture is this? And uh, yeah, of course, you're, you're laughing, all of you, but, but I could spend the entire 20 minutes just showing you these images from anywhere from Australia to, to Tierra del Fuego and from the North Pole to the South Pole. It, it just truly doesn't matter. We are living in a culture which is mad to the extreme. It's lost its senses and it's multiplying itself in, in a way that's leading us to an absolutely tragic dead end. And you will say, well, okay, Mr. Prophet, step down, sit down, enough, you know, let's get the next person to speak. But what's amazing about this this, this is that it's not about Cassandraism, it's not about you know, the prophecy of doom, it's about the fact that we do this, did this at some point out of kind of, you know, a kind of first world war, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome after the war. But a hundred years later, we can still go back to the simple idea of street and block, public space and lot, and distribution of buildings with its lots, and we know, we absolutely know from daily experience that this delivers, you know, my neighborhood where I live in, in South Pasadena, in, in, uh, in, it delivers the Fifth Avenue, it delivers us Rome, and it delivers us, you know, Quito, uh, places I've visited in the last six months. And all of them, all of them have a different character from each other. And if you sit down and take a deep breath and you think about this very carefully, Every place ever made in the world, according to these principles, has a different form for every other. I was in La Rioja two days ago, and I was walking through the, the Camino de Santiago, driving through, and visited three or four villages. And in fact, all villages were made under the same, both ideological, economic, and technical base. And they were all different. Their buildings were different, their, the way they were oriented to water and views and sun and, and, and countryside, the space between buildings was different, the monuments were different. 
It's an astounding thing in the 21st century for me to be wasting your time telling you that this way of making urbanism, this way of making urbanism is in any way unknown to you, unimportant in, in its ways, and not really necessarily the instrument we all have to ride in order to get out of this catastrophic predicament we're in. So, so why are we not doing it? What, what is really going on? I think one of the reasons is we are very poorly educated, most of us. We, we are not, we're not given any sense that, that we can move forward from what we know and execute at an appropriate level. And of course, that is because the world that educates us and the world that patronizes us and the way that manages us is actually tied to the world of making the city of nowhere. I am, I am I'm coming to you from a very unusual perspective. I've, used, I've lived in the United States for 50 years. I was educated in the United States, but I'm European to the core. I was born in Greece. I've lived there for 20 years of my life, and I've returned to Europe as often as I can, and I, I consider myself a kind of very strange creature of neither here or there in that respect, which is an unusual perspective. But I particularly uh, admire Spanish architectural and, and urbanist culture because I've lived it in its origins, and I've lived it in the colonies. And when you look at this map, which is completely shocking, is you, you recognize between, uh, between the, the, um, the, early, the late 16, uh, 1600s and the, re, the return of, of, of Spain from its, from its colonial adventures in the 19th century, there were 2,200 cities built in, in, uh, in, in, in the Americas, which is a, probably the most remarkable urbanist uh, uh, experiment and, and, and production ever, ever accomplished. So the question is, how, how do we recover all of this? How do we get to, to, the, to, to the right uh, state of mind and to the way of getting back and away from, from the current state of, of placemaking? I had, I had a very unusual last week before I came here in that I produced a very rapid book with an astronomer. Uh, November 4th was the 100 year anniversary of the first light on a plate, on a glass plate, in an observatory designed by Daniel Burnham in Southern California, which was the, the observatory through which uh, Edwin Hubble discovered, so first of all, the first, the first evidence of uh, galaxies be beyond our own, and some years later discovered that these galaxies were moving away from us. So I was sitting with my co-editor in a room having dinner, and before we started writing, writing a few small articles, he said to me, so what's important about the building? Why don't you tell me, you know, in a few paragraphs, why do you think this, this, this building is important? And I did. So after I finished, I said to him, okay, now you tell me why you think this instrument is important, the history of the world. And he turned to me and said something that sort of really shook me up. He said, that was because this instrument taught us to see the world the way it really is. And I thought to myself, well, what do you mean? He said, well, there are two ways to explain this, what I just told you. The first one is that the huge majority of us, astronomically speaking, are ignorant. So we don't see because we don't know. But then there's an elite of us that actually see but refuse to see what they see. And they believe in the wrong thing. And they're leading the world away from the way the, wor the world is. So this was a spectacular moment of enlightenment in which this man said, architect, you know, urbanist, wake up and look around you and realize why it is that people are, said, uh, why it is that people are, are, are coming to um, to uh, you know, the Adriatic coast or travel to Paris or do whatever they do. They do it because the places in which they live are insufferable, they're impossible to live in. They're, they're in places that deny the basic humanity of people to, to, de to deal with their basic lives in, 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 in a decent way, however chewed up the, the, the Italian or the French examples where these people are going might be. They're much superior to what they're leaving behind. So the question is, how do we get to see right? How do we get to act right? And I, have, I, have, I want to show you a couple of examples. And the first one is actually uh, a, a, an example fully, uh, fully um, conceptualized. But I want to show you seeing as, as, as seeing, seeing as, as drawing 
the, the, the cultural milieu in which, in which a work is to be, to be, to be, the, to be uh, executed. This is, this is a Hispanic setting in, in the state of New Mexico. Um, and, and this is of, of, a, of a whole plaza and buildings around it. And this is an analysis of, of, the, of the basic uh, architectural ingredients of, of this language. And then this is a drawing of the work of, of one of the masters of the style, uh, John Gomim. And the work that we executed as part of this project looks like this. It, it, there are attempts to take new programs and new, new uh, conceptions of ways in which one lives in a city of this, of, of this kind and express it in, in the natural terms of, of the language that are dominant in that place. But the second example I want to show you is an example of work in process. And I, want, I, I deeply appreciate everything I saw today by my colleagues. It has been a wonderful day. But much of the work that we saw was finished work. And I just, I thought to myself, this is an opportunity because there's so many young architects. And I know that Rafael was 81 yesterday. So I guess anybody under 81 is a young architect. So there are so many young architects in this room that, um, that it's important to actually get to understand these issues from the point of view of how we get there. How do we do this? And and also to get to understand it from a point of view of the desperation of the, of, of the settings in which we have to operate in. This is, and, and sometimes by the smallness of the opportunities, all of the above. This is Panama City. Panama City has about 300 skyscrapers, uh, that, and it looks generally like this. So, Panama City in pa Ciudad Panama. And it looks generally like this. It's a very wealthy country, it's a very advanced country, it's a very small country with a relatively good system of administration, it has a very bright future. A number of clients are very interested in working on a different way of, of, defining, of defining their city. And this is where uh, how, we, how we begin to think about getting there uh, it becomes terribly important. It seems to me that as architects, we need to, uh, to operate on an analytical basis, on a, on a uh, on an academic basis in terms of, of writing, uh, in, uh, we have to operate on, on understanding um, the, the analytical uh, and, and, the, and the constituent parts of, of what it is that we have at our disposal. But more than anything else, I think, we have to actually read and write and try to, try to gather the evidence in the most lively way that allows us to go forward. This actually is, is a, um, a, a plea for our Panamanian clients, these images, to actually look back at, at their hispanicity, if that's the right word in English, hispanidad, for them to actually try to understand who they are, try to, to understand that they are tropical Hispanics and not, you know, moderate climate Americans or, or Mediterraneans, and to really look deeply into themselves to try to understand what it was that they have to do. So our work, our work in principle, is divided into three uh, categories of, of investigation. We begin with trying to establish the proper mix of types within, within our projects. We proceed with trying to develop a sense of the character of these buildings in relation to, to each other, particularly in the context of, of city blocks. And we end up with questions of, of, of the actual constructive, uh, stylistic constructive aspects of buildings which give them their, their, their eventual physical presence. This work is literally torn off a, 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 a computer and, and a drafting board, and is here as an indication of this, of this process. So here are the types that are fundamental to the making of a, of, a, of a Hispanic public space. There are buildings that are mixed in use. There are buildings that have exaggerated and, and, and definitive ground floors. There are buildings that are broken in scale so that the, the public space has a, a, a presence that is diverse and, 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 and architecturally uh, significant by the difference among, among buildings. And the, 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 the level of, of, of detail and understanding of, of, the, of the, that lower floor is absolutely enhanced by, by the materiality and the detailing of the various pieces. And much of that is diachronic. Some of it comes from very, very old times. And some of it actually includes very many contemporary materials. Because one of the real issues of trying to, to execute this work is to, you have to execute it within not only the, the terms of, of what people know, but also what people have at their disposal and how they can actually take material and, and, and change it and, and, and forge it to, the, to their own uh, to their own um, 
to their current possibilities. And I was very interested in these hybrid solutions because, of course, the first time I told our clients and our collaborating architects that I was interested in doing this, they just left the room in despair. But when you actually could see that, that this was not an absolutist kind of, 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 of conceptually absolutist uh, universe, but it was a relativist one in the terms that you're seeing in these drawings, they, uh, they got the oxygen back into their system and they got blood in their face. So th this, these are ways of beginning to understand that there are ingredients that can be used in this work that have presence and they have potential of an extraordinary kind. And then there was the other miracle that happened in Panama. This is a really beautiful image. Um, the Casco Viejo, which is the old peninsular uh, urban center of the city, which was, the, which was built in the late 1600s, was completely abandoned 10 years ago. To I mean, the whole place looked like this, about 25 city blocks, just totally abandoned and falling apart. Until some local entrepreneurs decided it was time to do something about it. In the last 10 years, not, not only is it fully fixed, it's actually the cultural and commercial center of the entire city because the only, it's the only place where anybody can walk and anybody can actually talk to somebody next to you, next to him while walking. It's the only place with 60 restaurants and 10 hotels and you know, five, 10,000 people living next to each other in the manner in which um, uh, Leon already described in his work outside of Rimini. And, this is, this is what has happened in the last 10 years. All the ingredients of how you make a city have been rediscovered. So these lost souls who were actually floating buildings around are now spending a nice drink and being merry in a place like this, and they're asking themselves, who am I and why am I here? So this place, which looked like the, 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 the shot I showed you 10 years ago, now looks like this. So there is a structure of streets and space making within the streets, which is completely extraordinary and special. And there are public buildings and monuments inserted in the street system in the most brilliant way. I mean, I'm, I'm going very fast to this because I know you're very aware of, of these ideas and issues. There, there, are, uh, there are at least four or five squares in, this, in, this, in the city. It's not, it's not the most perfect uh, urbanistic or architectural environment, but there's enough in it that gives a pure understanding about how one is to construct a city of deep humanity and deep utility in the tropics. It is all there. There are different buildings in the way that they, they, they uh, co connect to squares and, and to, to streets. There are monuments of all kinds. There are magnificent Parisian moments in, in, in the definition of the grid. There's absolutely exotic public, uh, public uh, buildings as well. There is color to be found. There is, there is a nascent architectural detail to be found. And there is the beginnings. If you look closely, if you really begin to look closely, you begin to discern the difference between a tropical and a non-tropical architecture in, in the height of the volumes, in the way in which uh, air circulates between ceilings and roofs, in the way in which uh, windows and doors open, in the way light is kept in or out. So, and I think, by the way, this in parenthesis, that our greatest defense about placeless universalist modernism is to begin by telling people as a matter of religion that you don't build the same way in the tropics, in moderate climates, in humid climates, in dry climates, or in Arctic climates. That there are at least five or six architectures, or eight, how many you want to define, and that all of these architectures have to, by definition, be done in a different way from each other. Otherwise, all we're doing is, is we are, we are the slaves of, of petroeconomy, as Leon has spoken about so many times. And then this is the site. So you're going to say to yourself, are you, are you really crazy? I mean, what, 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 what is going on here? Well, this is a new town in, inside the city of Panama. There's a new hotel and high-rise building, and somebody wants to build a town center, the first phase, the second phase on the other side. Very tiny side, I think it's three hectares, the site. And, you know, this is how we're going to change the world. This is, this is the Apostle Paul walking into Athens and teaching on the Pnicks. The world was a mess around him, spiritually speaking. It was like this. And he said, look, there's a way out. That little thing is the way out. That little thing we're going to do here is the way out. So what did we do? First of all, you have to remember that as true urbanists, as a true architects, you have to obey the facts. And the retail trade has facts. In the real trail trade, you need continuous access to, to um, you need continuous access to storefronts. You need 
park once parking, when you actually have a couple of garages, you leave your car and you walk. You have to have a first class public realm. You have to have mixed use buildings that accommodate life in a variety of ways. So here's the basic way uh, that this, this project works. One part of it, there are three pieces, three sites, one, two, the third is, di third is the diagonal one, this is underground. One of them has an underground parking garage, the other one has two levels of garage, one over the other, and it's actually a liner. It is lined by buildings. I'm, excuse me. In the second level, you can see that the liner garage is there. There's a plaza and, and, um, and a series of, 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 of arcaded buildings. Arcade, of course, because of, of, the, of the climate. And, um, and access, access into, into the whole thing is, is from, the, from, top, from, from bottom to top. And the, the, the essence or the, um, the, the most important uh, compositional idea of a, of a retail center, the kind of place that would have been designed, I think, by others as by say, five boxes surrounded by cars, the essence of a walkable mixed use center of this kind is that it has to have multiple corner, corners and multiple terminations. One has to be completely engulfed, encased in a place like this. And then on the third level, you can see the housing. Uh, you can see the housing as opposed to uh, to, the basic, uh, to the basic retail buildings. So this is, this is what the project looks like. And I, I, I'm doing, as I said, I'm doing this on purpose. These are not finished drawings. This is SketchUp. I know all of you are using SketchUp. And the reason, the reason, why, uh, the reason why I showed this as SketchUp is because this is the work you're doing every day and you have to think about it in those terms. Here's the street. You can see the multiplicity of various buildings, the nature of the open space, and a private, and a private uh, place above. This is the entrance of the space, major market in the corner, series of buildings on, on the north side as stores with retail underneath. The building on the left is actually a school. Uh, and then this is, this is the walk into, 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 the, into, the, into the main street, the Arcade Street. You recognize the Hispanic types of, 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 of the plaza. They're all there. Uh, retail on both sides. We're up, here we're approaching, we're approaching the plaza building. Uh, here's the plaza with the market on one side, the, the, the housing of a retail to the right. This is looking back at the hotel where the, with, with the, 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 the liner on the left, retail underneath housing above. This is looking back at where we came from because the arcade is not only uh, a place that keeps you, keeps you uh, away from the weather in a very, very, very wet climate, but also becomes an organizer and a special, and a special image that is memorable and important. This actually is the plaza, a very small plaza for a relatively small, small project. As you can see, the tower actually centers you completely and is visible from the entire place. Uh, the buildings have, have, in the tropics, all of them need to have ample arcades, so life is as important indoors as outdoor. All you need is fans to keep, to keep life bearable in the outdoors. This is looking from the hotel back at the place. This is a, the Mercado on the left, and then the, the liner building on the right, the, the street cutting across. But you can see it's a scenographic arrangement of buildings that completely respects the measures and the, the parts that come from this, the, the traditions that the Panamanians have never seen before, because they're partly building types and, and parts come from the Casco Viejo, but others that come from a much broader and richer and more diverse and more diverse Hispanic uh, tradition. So this, this really is the way in which one makes cities like this and with the way in which one makes, makes order and vision in a place that is orderless and visionless. Actually, it's a definition of pure chaos. And, and by excluding cars from certain places, you can make medieval streets and by breaking up the buildings along along uh, grid lines and geometries which are, which are more diverse, you can also create tremendous visual variety uh, by, by modifying the, the, the individual form of buildings in various parts. So this is, this is what the project looks uh, uh, li at the end. It's like, it's like a tablet of, uh, in which the, the future of this, of this country almost rests upon. There are three clients that in Panama that are actually pursuing this kind of work. And, um, it's nonetheless a, a, a kind of, of, of indication, a kind of illustration of how almost every place uh, in, in, in the known world ought to be approached from the perspective of analysis, identification, um, of choice of parts, combination of parts, and an and ultimate, um, ultimate architectural and urban form. I want to, I want to finish with one uh, one statement that has to do with these two gentlemen st standing in front of me next to Leon, with Alejandro and, and with Javier. Um, we are all responsible for where we take our world on a daily basis. The world 
is literally in our hands, okay? So one of the things we're deeply responsible for, one of the things I'm, I'm strongly, I mean, I'm really obsessed by throughout my, my, my professional life is actually being in this community, in this community, uh, even with the empty chairs, Leon, uh, because there are, other, there are others listening and others who will fill the chairs. And it seems to me we're responsible to each other in telling each other how the world is really made, what is the world is actually about as we understand it. And one of the greatest intellectual disasters of, 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 of Spain's last 50 years has been the fact that the history of 19th century Spain, the urban history of 19th century Spain, has been negated by the fact it's not considered to be modern. The Ensanche movement is the most profound movement in the, in, in, in the history of this country, its identity, and the best of its living environments, and it is really a catastrophe and a crime that is not being understood as such. Because every part that is in an Ensanche is a, is a well-lived and a well-livable part, and the periphery of every city in this country is a mess. And uh, this is true for all of you other Europeans who are in this room. It's absolutely the same for all, the same for all of you as well. Um, and this is, this is what we're doing for this book. It's a book we're putting together. There's 52 Ensanches in Spain. And we haven't exactly decided how we're going to do it, but we know that we're going to talk about the, the growth of cities and the actual historic pattern in which each city was grown. Then we're going to choose particular architectural fragments and look at the way blocks are made and streets are made and illustrate that. And of course, this will be a lot of critical essays and a lot of, of noise made. But I want you, I, this is your country and your, 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 uh, uh, your uh, urban history, but I want you to understand how profoundly important it is. This is in 1876. In other words, Bilbao, as we know today, is younger than Los Angeles. You've got to think about this because this is important. Bilbao is, is, is younger than the American West in terms of its physical presence. It was a village in 1876, a village. So, so here's, here's the first in Sanche. This is an idea about how to, how to make the city and how to make it well, and God knows it's well made. Javier took us around it. We're speechless by the, by the power of the, of the architecture of the city. And this is where it was in 1936. Why? Because architecture is sequential and grows over time. And it's a magnificent model because it, it, it does what, what uh, could not be done in the case of the project that, that, that Leon showed. It takes a plan and marries it with public authority, which then distributes the private to private parties, and, the, and, and it's built under, under an aura, an aura of completeness of form which is really quite remarkable. And here it is, in 1936. You know what year 1936 was. It was not a very pleasant year. But one of the, of the aspects of the, of the Franco regime that lasted until the 1960s is that during this 100 years, by the lack of the draw, for whether you like it or not, your country did not get attached to Siam urbanism. It bypassed a lot of other things and had to look through a lot of brutality and other issues. But it, it did not get into into the urbanism of, of the rest of Europe, the unfortunate, deplorable urbanism, until the 1960s when the Spanish government decided to adopt the American way of business. And what is the American, business, American way of business, you decide, would you say? I think we can say it in one word, chaos. That means every man, woman, and child for themselves. So I own a piece of land there, I can build it. You own that there, you could do that there. And you get basically sprawl. You get sprawl. Uh, what the, the Swedes call, not suburbia, but slaburbia. You get slaburbia. So he, here, here it is, um, excuse me, here it is the scale between, between the, 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 the urban neighborhoods and the, the 19th century neighborhoods and the, um, the pre-existing uh, neighborhoods. You can see the, the difference in blocks and eventually, of course, the difference of buildings, et cetera. And this is my last slide. And I want you, I want you to, to, to uh, not sleep well tonight for at least 10 minutes thinking about this. this is really a, a great nightmare as Europeans for you to think about. Because you never think about this. And it's the core of the disaster that you're experiencing. It's the core, I think, of the, of, of the way in which this, this continent is being incrementally destroyed in the, in the, in the, mo in the mode of putting the, you know, uh, put, put in, in the mode of introducing uh, What's the animal I'm thinking about? It's not coming to me. The, into hot water? What, what animals do we put in hot water? Frog. Thank you, sir. The frog in hot water. Right. So here, here's Bilbao in 1876, 
with the limits of the city. Here's Bilbao uh, in 2016, uh, and, and with the, the, uh, in the second image. Then comes uh, Bilbao growth in 1936, which is the, the third image, and gray is actually a little bit of, of, of uh, sprawl towards the port, and this is Bilbao today. Look at the sprawl around it, and the little yellow dot is the ensanche. It is completely, absolutely inadmissible and shocking. And um, it is something I think we all have to work on in the years to come. Thank you.